And that night ended up being the most scariest night for me.、Uh, you know, I ended up sleeping in my jacket and my hat and my gloves, and it was cold. I almost felt like there was like fingers kind of touching my body. I remember it being dark, and I'm looking up. I could see like two eyes looking back down at me,、mm. and I just remember thinking like, I can't live like this. And so I, I ended up praying. I actually said, because I remember what my parents told me all those years ago that you gotta stay Buddhist, and and I said, God, if you're real. And you want me to do this? Then you gotta help me with my parents. My name is Apisit Varia, but I go by I, like the letter. I am 42. I work at NIH as a contracting officer. I do you come from a religious background? Yes, I grew up、uh, Buddhist. And that comes from generations, just your family, or yeah, I、uh, I'm Thai, Thai American.、Uh, so my parents are from Thailand, and. If anyone knows anyone who's Thai, it's ninety-five percent of the population is is Buddhist.、Mm. So naturally, I grew up that way here, being in America, still、uh, having the same values that my parents instilled in me.、Mm. So, so where does your story start? Yeah, I mean, like I said, growing up here,、um, born born here and raised here, my parents had emphasized in me a young age, at a young age, that、um, you know, to be Thai,、uh, even living here in the states, we have to keep our Thai identity. So we have to stay Buddhist. I remember hearing that at a at an early age, and so I just you know just ran with it. I went with it, and we would my brother and I, who's two years younger, we would go to the temple on Sundays and during the summer to learn the Thai language, but also incorporated in that was learning Buddhism.、Mm. So just, I grew up that way, and it was just normal for me, natural for me.、Uh, it wasn't until about I was about twelve. My brother being ten, that we started、uh, having our own kind of supernatural experiences in in our home.、Uh, by supernatural, I mean hearing voices、uh, calling our name,、uh, doors cl- closing by themselves, and、mm-hmm. to the point where, you know, my brother and I would approach our parents, but of course at that age they wouldn't believe you.、Uh, they they thought we maybe we had too much candy, or maybe we、uh, had watched some scary shows. So at that age, my brother and I had to comfort one another. So when things happened to him, he would come tell me, and when things happened to me, I would go talk to him. And for myself, I re- remember that because of all these things, I knew that the reality wasn't just the physical world that we see. I knew that there was something more than that. And being raised Buddhist, I sought answers through Buddhism.、Hmm. the The strange thing is that I had asked. Uh, one of the monks at at the at the Buddhist temple、uh, about God, and then he told me that there is no God in Buddhism. Essentially, traditional Buddhism. I came from a Theravada Buddhism background, and what they what they teach, what Buddha taught, is essentially a way to make it through life with without suffering or with minimal suffering.、Mm. Uh, Buddhism acknowledges that suffering, and there's things that. Buddha taught to minimize that suffering in your life. Some of these things were based on attachments, so not being attached to things because things are impermanent, right? Things were going to go away. So if you're attached to them, and when they're gone, you're gonna you're gonna suffer. So、mm-hmm. it's, it's more like a philosophy or a way of life that that you can live your life in that way and to minimize the suffering.、Mm-hmm. Now that's in a nutshell the, the traditional Buddhism that I learned. But what I Understood and saw at at the temple was there was kind of this spirituality that came with it, and I didn't learn till later. But there's a term for it called folk Buddhism, which means that、uh, Buddhism, the traditional Buddhism, mixed with the local religion in Thailand or wherever Buddhism had traveled. So in Thailand, there was a lot of animism, you know, spirits, you know, in 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 nature, in the trees, in the rocks, things like that.、Um, And then when Buddhism came, it kind of just incorporated with the local animism that was there.、Mm. So if you go to Thailand today, you'll see a lot of you know spirit houses, shrines. You know they'll almost make offerings to to these spirits as a way of appeasement. You know if I if I offer you this thing, then I won't you won't bother me.、Mm. You know if I if I show you respect, then maybe you'll bless me. So this kind of, it's kind of mixed in、uh, spirituality with it. So there. In folk Buddhism, there is an acknowledgement of the spiritual world, and so this is the kind of Buddhism I grew up in, and、uh, I learned and I practiced. You know, with the meditation, I would also do the the bowing three times and the、mm-hmm. prayers. And it wasn't until college where 
I went to a University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and it was here that I first heard about Jesus. And coming from a Buddhist background and just knowing that, hey, I'm Thai, I gotta be Buddhist, you know, I would I would hear about Jesus, but then I would also tell people about Buddha. Hmm. Um, you know, sometimes it'd be friendly conversation, sometimes it'd be friendly debate, but essentially uh, I was adamant, like I will never become a Christian. You know, I'm gonna stay Buddhist. Uh, I didn't see that Buddhism was lacking anything, so there's no need to change. And it was enough for me. And despite this kind of resistance, I remember clearly a friend of mine, uh, we were just sitting in the car and I knew that she sincerely meant what she believed. And she told me again, the, the gospel story, but this time I, I really listened, I paid attention because I knew that the way she was sharing it, the way she approached it, that she was sincere, that she really thought that this Jesus is someone I needed. Do you remember what was it about what she was saying that connected with you? Like yeah, specifically? Yeah, um, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't say that there was something sp specific, but I think what made the impression on me was that genuine care. Mm. So that uh, that genuine care broke down whatever walls I had of like, while you're talking, I'm gonna get ready to talk about Buddhism. Right, so I kind of said, okay, well, you approaching me very like humbly and gently, and, and we're already friends, and it wasn't in a combative way. So my guard was down, mm -hmm. and I I heard the gospel story about, you know, my um, how Jesus loves me, you know, how He died for my sins on the cross, you know, that He rose again, and and that uh, He wants a relationship with me, you know. So she she shared it, you know, simple gospel presentation, but. You know, at the end, I said, thank you for sharing Jesus with me. Uh, let me tell you about Buddha. So I ended up telling her about Buddha anyway. But that was the first time I remember actually the, the, the story or the understanding of who Jesus is really kind of made its first kind of impact in my, into my mind. Um, and I kind of kept it on the back burner. You know, I was invited to church after that. And sometimes I would visit, um, but never never really to to really seek out Jesus. It was more just... My friends invited me, so I'm gonna go. Hmm. And and, yeah. and and at this time too, like, what do you remember of your thoughts about Jesus? Like, what, what were you thinking as you were hearing like Jesus's name? Yeah, I, you know, it's 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 interesting. So, I almost thought of it like it was a a Western religion, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, you know, this is Buddhism. Uh, it's something that, you know, I, in my mind, all Thais were, were Buddhist. And so I have to represent, I have to, you know, um, stay in stay in this um, religion and this faith. And when I'm hearing about Jesus, there was, there was no incentive for me to you know, believe what they were saying. Because, you know, it's almost like, it almost sounded, the way it was shared to me, it was very like exclusive. You need, you need to, you need to have Jesus. Mm. And for me, that was as a Buddhist. It's, Buddhism is in general. Buddhists are very open, like to you know, hearing about other religions and even trying to incorporate, you know, this uh, the ideas in your faith and trying to see how they how they uh, are similar and things like that. But when when someone was like, you know, it has to be Jesus. He's the only way. And for me, that was like, well, you're a little bit close-minded. It was interesting because in my mind, even though I knew traditional Buddhism has had no spirituality component, but maybe because of the folk Buddhism background, I almost thought of Buddha and Jesus as like similar, right? Like mm -hmm. there, there are different ways to a higher power. I, I think I did believe in God at the time, but almost like it wasn't a focus, you know, and, and uh, I would occasionally like pray to the, the Buddha statue, mm -hmm. you know, as if it was God, God yeah. you know, asking for things and praying for protection and things like that. So there was this kind of understanding that Buddha, there's a spiritual power behind it, mm -hmm. right? And even though traditionally, like I said, there is no, but that's how I thought of it. So it was almost as if, well, Jesus is not, maybe it's that's your way to connect with God, or I didn't think too much of it at that point. Uh, around the same time as I'm, you know, in college, and I, I started experiencing some, symptoms of of depression and also 
what was diagnosed as, as OCD, um, obsessive compulsive disorder. So the, the way it manifested itself for me at the time was I would keep having to repeat things, uh, whether it be like an action or, or a thought in my head until I felt peace. And it was almost like a thought or a voice saying, if I don't, if, I, if you don't do X, then something bad could happen to a loved one. If you don't scream at the top of your lungs down this hallway, then something bad's gonna happen to your mom, for example, this is an example. And you know, occasionally I would be able to resist and forget about it. Other times it would just be so, so much anxiety that I just ended up giving in just, just in case something were to bad happen to my loved one, I would just give in. Anyways, this coupled with the depression led me to seek help. So I went to the school counselor and they had referred me outside of the university because they said it was a little bit more serious than what they're used to. So I sought um, help outside from therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists. And this is something I battled for years. Um, and it was, it was very difficult to, to, to try to finish, to try to do school and eventually get a job and, and maintain that job while wrestling with all these thoughts and depressions. It, it was tough. And I remember going from therapist to therapist, psychiatrist to psychiatrist. And at the, at the peak, it was about 12 pills a day that I had to take. And I just knew that that was too much. I had to, I had to come back off of it. And, and, and something had to change. I couldn't imagine my future like this. If, if I'm like this in my early 20s, how am I gonna live the rest of my life? So I just, you know, I sought help medically, but I also dove even deeper into Buddhism. So, you know, meditation at home, you know, um, studying prayers, things like that. And, um, you know, going to the temple to, to pray in the evenings with the monks. And it, it, it pushed me that way. And what, what I realized internally was that while Buddhism acknowledges that suffering that's in the world, for me, it almost didn't provide a solution, a hope. Mm. It was almost a survival mentality. Like, yeah, this world is full of suffering. And here's, you know, if you don't get attached to things and, and you know, you pray, you, you meditate, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to navigate this life with less suffering. And then in the next life, you might be born again in a better situation. And for me, that was, that was not enough of a solution to give me hope. You know, it was almost like a, yeah, like a survival mentality. And mm. it was around when I was 25, where I went to a, a new, a new therapist. And at the first interview, they, they tell me up front, this is a Christian, this is a Christian facility. Are you okay with that? And at that point I was so desperate. I was so um, hurting, so lost that I said, that's fine. I just didn't care. And I remember every time we would meet, the, the therapist would ask, is it okay if I prayed for you? And I said, okay, each time. Now I never made the connection um, between the prayer, but I remember this is the last therapist I ever saw. Uh, after meeting with, with this therapist, things did improve for me. Um, and I never, I never had to go back and eventually I got off the pills. And so after around 25, I was, I thought that, you know, life is manageable now. It wasn't as bad as earlier. I still had, I still had some of the symptoms, but, um, it was, yeah, I could handle it. And even some of the spiritual occurrences that I experienced when I was young, they were still, they still occurred throughout my life, but it was never as frequent as when I was young, uh, young teenagers years. Uh, so I think, okay, well, this is, a, this is the way forward. At least, you know, I can, I can survive this way. Now it wasn't until I was 30 that I went back to school for, for my graduate degree. So I went to university of Maryland college park. And I remember doing, during my studies, I would be at, I would, I was at home one day and I was studying in my brother's room and as I was studying, you know, I got hungry. So I decided to go upstairs to get some food. And after, after getting the food, I, I walked back to my brother's room. And as I walk down to, to his room, I see uh, a shadow figure kind of walk, walk past the light so that I could see, you know, the, the outline of the arms and the legs and the head. And I thought, I literally thought someone was in the room, maybe my dad or someone had gotten in the room and I go in there and, and there was no one there. And so I, I, I paused for a moment and I, I was like, whoa, what's going on? Cause I had always, uh, heard things or maybe felt things, but I've never actually seen anything with my eyes. Mm. And that was the first time seeing things. Anyways, I went back to studying and 
it stuck with me. So on the weekend, I ended up going to the temple and talking to one of the monks. As I'm talking to him, I tell him what happened. And he tells me, you know, there are spirits that are in this world. And sometimes it's because the spirit of the person couldn't move on to their, to their next life. Mm. And I asked, you know, okay, so what am I supposed to do? And he says, well, the reason that their spirits can't move on is because they, haven't, they don't have enough merit. Um, in Thai, we call it bun. And essentially, in, the spirit needs more merit to move on. So I said, okay, well, okay, now what, what should I do? Uh, is there anything I can do? And then the monk said, well, you can share your merit with the spirit. And, you know, I trust him. So I said, okay, how can I, how can I do that? So he, he tells me to go back to my house and, and meditate. And then while I'm meditating, just share your merit with the spirit, right? So I, I, I go back home. I, I'm, I'm back in my brother's room and I'm, I'm meditating. And as I'm meditating, I, I, I feel there's something in, that in, enters the room, right? It gets a little bit cold. And so I say, okay, I think something's here. So I, I just said, hey, like, I'm going to share my merit with you. After I said that, I felt like the cold kind of come in my body. And so I, I was like, okay, something's wrong. So I go to, I go to my parents and I, I asked them if they were cold and they said no. Uh, and so I knew, I knew at that point, okay, well, something's wrong. And, you know, for the next two weeks, I'm constantly cold. I, I would be wearing my jacket and hat, gloves indoors. You know, granted it was, it was around February at that time, but when I was indoors, my friends would be in their t-shirts and shorts because the heat's on, but I would still feel cold. I would still feel as if someone left the door, the window open and there was like a draft constantly for two weeks. And on top of that, you know, strange things happen in the house. I would start seeing kind of things and, and sensing there's something like watching me. And so I was, although I was 30 at that point, I, I was scared to stay at home. So I ended up packing a bag and uh, staying at my friend's apartment near College Park. And I just spent the nights on his couch uh, while I was going to school. Uh, that was until I saw that shadow figure pass by in his, in his place, like along the wall. And I was like, okay, something's following me now. I knew I knew something was following me, and I was like, I don't want to put this on my friend. <laughs> like whatever it is, I don't want it to bother my friend and his roommate. So I end up packing my things again, and I, I go to the temple. Uh, I knock on the door around 10:30 at night, and uh, the monk lets me in, gives me a room. And in the morning, he sits with me, and we do. He does uh, some Buddhist rituals with me, some prayers, and some offering of uh, gifts. I guess it's almost like an appeasement to the spirit and uh, you know, he says, if it doesn't stop, just come back. Okay, so a few days later I come back, it hasn't stopped. You know, we sit, we talk and uh, he told me, you know, some people just have a weaker mind. They're more affected by, you know, spiritual things like this. And so for me, it almost sounded like there's nothing, there's nothing else to be done. Like it's mm -hmm. just, you just have a weaker mind. And so for me to hear that, I was very distraught. Um, I started feeling hopeless. What am I gonna do? I remember, you know, coming out of class at ten at night and walking to my car and just thinking, I'm in trouble. Like, what's gonna happen? I didn't see like what's the way forward for me. I'm 30, but I'm like again, like how can I how can I live like this? And so I I was distraught. I I get to the car, I turn on the car, and then the radio comes on. And as the radio comes on, there, there's a preacher or a pastor on my radio, and I was surprised because at that point I was listening to, you know, hip hop stations or, you know, top 40 and things like that. And I was like, why is there a preacher on my radio? And I remember thinking to myself, well, if this is a sign from God, I'm going to listen and, and see what, what it's going to say. So I, I, I sat in my car, I listened. And what the preacher said was, well, he started with a question. Do you ever feel like you're in the middle of the ocean and there's waves hitting you from every direction? And I was thinking, yeah, that's kind of how I feel right now. And, and he says, do you ever wonder why God would put you in this situation or allow you to be in this situation? And I said, yeah. And then he, he says, sometimes God will allow you to be in those situations so that the waves will push you closer to him. Hmm. And so I took that as a, as a sign and I said, okay, if I'm going through all this craziness that I could meet God, then I will go check out church on Sunday. So Sunday comes around. I I go back to my friend's church who had invited me 10 years ago. And I just show up. I didn't tell him I was coming. You know, I go and I sit in the back corner. I wasn't there to socialize. I wasn't there to see anyone. And, 
And as I'm sitting there, they begin the, the worship where they start singing. And I remember I just started tearing, started bawling. And I was trying to do it covertly. So I was kind of covering my face. And I didn't know why. I just almost felt like I was, stuff was bottled inside me for so long. And then when the worship began, I just, it just came out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, worship ends and the pastor begins his sermon. And what he is preaching on is demons. And he was describing, you know, if, if there's demonic activity around you, this is what you might feel. You might feel this cold breeze and things like that. And I was like, what he's describing is what I'm going through right now. And this is crazy. Like I was just in shock almost like this is what I'm going through. And at the end, they, they close in worship again. I'm tearing, I'm bawling. And um, my friend though, the same friend who, who saw me, who shared the gospel with me like 10 years ago, she, she saw me and she said, I was wrong. And I said, I, I'm going through something right now. I can't talk about it. The only one I've told this whole time was the monk. No one else knew because I thought it sounded crazy. So she says, fine, would you at least come up and get prayer? And so I said, sure, I'll do that. I go up to the front. There's a couple of pastors and people there waiting to pray for people who ever wanted to pray, who ever wanted to get prayer. And, uh, you know, they asked me, how can we pray for you? And I gave them like a little snippet of what I'm going through, not, not going into any kind of detail, but they knew, especially with the sermon being what it was that day. And uh, I remember one of the pastors said, look, we can pray for you and you may feel better, but the only way to be truly free is if you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I said, no, I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm Buddhist. And then he said, okay, well, that's fine. You know, we're just going to bless you. So they prayed for me. After prayer, I felt, I felt better. I did feel like almost like lighter. And so I said, well, maybe it's gone. So I'm going to go back home, spend the night at my house. And that night ended up being the most scariest night for me. Uh, you know, I ended up sleeping in my jacket and my hat and my gloves and it was cold. I almost felt like there was like fingers kind of touching my body. I remember it being dark and I'm looking up. I could see like two eyes looking back down at me. Mm. And I just remember thinking like, I can't live like this. And so I, I ended up praying. I actually said, because I remember what my parents told me all those years ago that you got to stay Buddhist. And, and I said, God, if you're real and you want me to do this, then you got to help me with my parents. So it was the next day, Tuesday morning, before they went to church, I mean, we went to work. I went up to them and I said, look, can I talk to you guys before you guys head out? And they said, sure, what's going on? And I said, hey, I'm going through something right now. Um, it's been really tough. And they knew because you know, I'm their son, they knew I was stressed about something, not knowing what it was. And they said, sure, how, uh, what is it? You know? And I said, I think I found something that can help me and it's religion. And they said, sure, which one? And I said, Christianity. And they said, well, if you think that's gonna help you, then, then go for it. And I was, a little, I was like a little thrown aback. That was so simple. I ended up going to the, that pastor's house he doesn't, he's, he's basically my neighbor. So I just walked to his house and, you know, I sit in his, in his kitchen and he tells me the gospel again. After hearing my story, he tells me the gospel, tells me about Jesus. And he asked, you know, do you want to, do you want to follow him? Do you, do you want him in your life? And I said, yes. I remember he, he was like, okay, I'm going to lead you through a prayer. Right. And I, I remember at that moment, before I was going to pray, I almost felt, I almost heard like, not audibly, but I heard uh, a growl, almost like a err, right? Mm. He leads me through the prayer and I'm, I'm praying along with him. And, you know, I leave his house. As I leave his house, I'm just thinking, well, I guess I'm a, I'm a Christian now. I still have to go to school. So I drive to the, the library at Maryland and I'm studying. And I remember feeling electricity, like electricity, like almost like a like electrical feeling going through my feet. And I'm like, okay, well, what is this? So I try to, I try to get it to stop and it wouldn't stop. And I, I was just like, okay, I'm done. Like if this is, if I'm going to, if I'm getting possessed right now, then I'm going to get possessed right now. Right. So it's, it's, it doesn't stop and it's slowly going up my leg. Um, but the interesting thing is everywhere it passed, everywhere below it, it was warm now. So I was like, well, at least it's warm. So I just, I just go with it, right? So I, I end up going to the my night class. It's about 9 p.m. at night and the tingling is up here now. It's like tingling and I'm just feeling warm. And the moment the tingling gets to the top of my head, 
the lights in the in the lecture hall turn off and on three times. So it's like on off, on off, on off. And the teacher, the professor stops teaching and he's like, whoa, there's like a ghost in here. And everyone starts laughing, but I'm like, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's probably me. Yeah. It's probably because of me. And I say, well, I don't know what's going on right now, but I feel good. I feel warm. I feel light. And so after class, I'm, I'm walking, I'm walking to uh, my car and I end up calling my friend uh, who I was staying on, the friend who I was staying on the couch with. And I said, hey, I'm going to come over and hang out with you for a bit. And he says, well, maybe you shouldn't come over. There's no, there's no power here. And then at that moment, I heard like a different voice, another voice in my, in my mind saying, if you go to his place, the power will come back on. And I was like, well, this has been a weird enough day. So I'm just going to. I'm just going to go. And I said, hey, I'm coming over anyway, so I'll see you there. Now, the interesting thing is, for the past two weeks, not only was it cold, but whenever I would be driving, whether it's like on a highway or streets, there's the street lights. And so when I passed the street light, the lights would turn off. Not every single one, but for me, enough for me to know that this is not normal. Like I would drive and it would turn off, drive and turn off. And so with, with that happening, I remember like, okay, well, I'm going to my friend's house whose power is, is is off at this point. And so I'm you know the street lights are out and I pull into his apartment complex and as I pull into his apartment complex all the lights in the in the facility turn on. And so I was like, "Wow." So I walk in and I said, "Hey, what's going on?" And he said, "The power went off three different times." And it came on when you got here. And I was like, "Wow, what is going on?" And I was just a little bit in shock, amazed, but I ended up talking to my my pastor, the one who led me through the prayer. And I talked to my pastor and I tell him what had occurred that day that I accepted Christ. I told him the, the story and I and I was like, "What's going on?" And he says, "Whoa, that well, when you when you accept Christ, when you accept Jesus, you get the Holy Spirit. God's spirit comes to live in you." And I and that was the warmth that you felt coming in and pushing whatever it was out. And I was like, "Wow, okay, you know, so maybe that's what's going on and I remember waking up, you know, in the morning and it was as if my whole life I was wearing sunglasses and the sunglasses were just lifted off. And I just remember thinking like, this is the most beautiful morning I've ever seen in my life. Like the sun was out, the birds were chirping and I was like, this is amazing. And I remember sitting in my car and it, it, it really clicked, it hit me, like my goodness. Jesus is real. Jesus, the one they told me about 10 years ago, or is real. And I'm like, God sees me right now and God is with me right now. Mm -hmm. And I almost like started like hyperventilating and I was like, <gasps> and I was just tearing because it, it just hit me in the, in, in the car, it just hit me. And I was like, wow. So from that moment on, I was like, I have to know who, I have to know, I have to know who you are, God. Like, I, I feel like I need to know you. And so I've, I pursued him since then and just, I, was, I, I need to learn more about who you are and, you know, you saved me and I need to, I need to understand you so I can appreciate you. And I remember asking God, I was like, why did I have to go through all that, right? Like, why couldn't you have saved me when I was 18, yeah. you know, before I had to go through all the depression and OCD and things like that. And, and then I remember God spoke to me and he said, I can use all that it simply just, I can use all that. And, and since that time I've come to see like, okay, well, you know, all those things I went through, even talking to psychiatrists, psychiatrists and therapists. And when, even when I meet someone now who's going through that, it's not weird to me, you know, cause I've been through it, you know, and even people who share their spiritual stories with me about, you know, crazy things happening in the house, I'm not surprised or not confused by it cause I've been through it and I can see what God meant like he can use all that. So I can relate now. And though it wasn't easy, it was, I could see how God can use the tough things that we've been through to help, to help others yeah. go through, who are going through it. You know, what I, what I would want to say is that, you know, that just the same questions I was, I was thinking when I was in my mid twenties, like how can, where's the hope, you know, where's the hope for my future? Where's the Thing, the better day that I can look forward to. And, and I didn't know what it was until Jesus, right? Until I'm meeting, until meeting God where there is a purpose for my life. There is something where, greater than, than me just going to school and getting a job and 
getting married, having kids and, and then dying. I mean, they're all good things, but I'm just like, there has to be more to life. You know, there has to be more. And I didn't know what that more was until meeting Jesus. And so what I would say to people, you know, who are watching this is that, you know, oftentimes we, we feel like when we're comparing ourselves to other people, that we're generally good people, right? We haven't killed anybody, you know, well, most people haven't killed people. And so I'm generally good and maybe I think I'll go to heaven, right? But what what I've learned that's just different, because even in Buddhism, it was th- it was that way. I would think of it as a scales, right? If I do more good than bad, then it'll tilt my way and then I'll, I'll either be born again in a better life or I'm going to heaven, right? Mm-hmm. But if there was a judge who's a good judge, who's a, a fair judge, and they they had some they had someone in their courtroom who who is a doctor, and the, and the doctor may have saved hundreds of lives during their career, and then one day maybe they had too much to drink and they they hit somebody with their car and that person dies. The doctor goes before the judge and says like, "Hey, um, I've saved hundreds of lives. I've only killed one person. You know that good judge." wouldn't be just if they just said, okay, yeah, you're right. You're, you're free to go, right? You've saved, you've saved 100, you killed one, you're free. Like, don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. You know, that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be just. And if we think that way with a, an earthly judge, then we have to think that way, how much more with the ultimate judge, which is, which is God. If he's just and fair, he's not gonna be able to say like, oh, well, you've done more good than bad, so you're, good, you're, you're welcome to come to heaven with me, right? There has to be a uh, payment an atonement for what you've done wrong. And th- the fact is we can't pay for it ourselves. You know, nothing, we, nothing good we do can erase the bad. And that's why Jesus sent his own son who lived a sinless life. He never did any sins and he took our punishment, what was meant for us on that cross. That's why he died on the cross. And it wasn't just that he died, but he rose again from the dead, defeating death, defeating sin, defeating the devil. Yeah. And because of what he did on the cross, he's able to forgive us. He's able to say, you know, your sins are covered. I've paid for it. It's almost like someone paying your bail, right? Like you're in jail and someone comes and pays for your bail and you're free to go. There, the justice is still there. The love is there. And because someone actually paid for what you did wrong, that justice is served. God is a God of love and justice. Mm-hmm. And so I would just encourage you to, to look into it, to put your trust in Jesus. You know, he loves you. He's ready to forgive you. It's a free gift. You just have to accept it. And that's my sincere prayer, you know, for anyone watching this who doesn't yet know. Just if you're not sure, look into it. You know, what I don't want is, you know, we, we, we invest in our future all the time, right? Like we, we, we look, we research the colleges that we want to go to. We try to find the best job. We, we have a retirement plan, right? But then when it comes to what happens after death, we don't, a lot of people don't think about it. They're just, I'm going to live my life. But why? I mean, I would think, that that's the most important thing we should look into, right? So at least look into it, explore it, see if it makes sense, right? And if, and if it does, put your trust in him. That's it. Did your parents ever come to follow Jesus? You know, that's, that's a good question. So uh, not yet. You know, I, I'm praying for them every day and my, my brother. Um, as far as I know, I'm the only one in my family right now who's, who's a follower of Christ. Um, you know, the interesting thing is that culturally, a lot of people can relate to this, but I remember, you know, they were okay with me accepting Christ. Yeah. And then two weeks later, it was an interesting conversation, almost like they thought I wasn't serious. So they were like, oh, you're, because I ended up, what, what had happened, I gave all my Buddhist things back to my parents. Mm. Yeah, you know, I was like, I thought it was disrespectful to just throw it in the trash. So I said, here, like, I'm a Christian now and I want to give this back to you. And I think that, they, that showed them that I was really serious. So they're like, oh, you're really serious about this. And they started asking me difficult questions like, well, you know, you're the oldest son. So who's going to take care of those religious rights when we die? And I'm like, and I don't know how to answer that. I'm like, mom, I, dad, I don't know. Just all I know is that I got to follow Jesus, right? Now, what, what do you... What do you mean by who's going to take care of those religious rights? Yeah, so what it what is like is at least in 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 Thai Buddhist traditions, when someone passes away, they do like a ceremony, like a merit making for that person who passed on. So mm. it's kind of like um, I would go to the temple and like serve the monks food and donate money, donate um, supplies, and almost like the the thinking is 
because of the good things I'm doing in your behalf, then you get these blessings in the next life. And so almost like who's going to do these things for us, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm sorry. And I remember, I remember praying so hard to God. And I was like, Lord, like, please save them. Please save them. And, and this is, I remember this is one morning I was actually at my, my friend's apartment. I was praying. I was like, Lord, please save my, my parents. Please save my brother. And, and then I heard a question that didn't make sense at the time, but it was like, do you love me more than you love your parents? Hmm. And I was like, cause my parents were like number one, right? And so I was like, I'm gonna ignore that. Maybe that's the demon again. So I'm just gonna ignore that question. And again, like throughout the day, do you love me more than your parents? And I was like, I'm not gonna answer that question. And then until at nighttime, I was, you know, praying at my bed before I went to bed, I went to sleep. And again, it's like, do you love me more than you love your parents? And I was like, oh my goodness. I was like, okay, if you're gonna make me answer this, I'm, gonna, I'm a little bit upset, but if you're gonna make me answer this, then yes, God, I love you more than I love my parents. And I felt horrible saying those things, but I was like, I love you more. And then I heard him say, don't you know I love your parents more than you do? And I was like, whoa. So like, I didn't expect that. And I was like, wow. So I will still pray for my parents and my brother every day, but it's, ne it's not the same type of prayer, almost like I'm pleading with God, like, please save them, please save them. Cause I, I'm praying from a perspective that I know he loves them already mm. and that he wants to save them. I'm still praying for them, but not in the same manner. And I think God was teaching me that. Like, don't think I don't care about your parents and you have to beg me to care about them. It's not like that. So I think that's what I took away from that. Any last words that you may have for people watching? No, just put your trust in Christ. Like, it's not gonna disappoint you. That's all, yeah.